So I think that's it from me. I'm going to pass the baton on to um, Margot, who's going to, to run through why it matters, a bit of scene setting, what the motivations are, get us all motivated and um, understand the context in which we're doing this activity. So over to you, Margot. Thank you, Becky. Um, just to introduce myself again, I'm Margot Turner and I am in the Transport Strategy team at Wandsworth Council. Um, and part of our remit is encouraging more travel by walking, cycling and public transport um, as part of our wider aims, which include um, sort of air quality targets as well as reducing congestion um, and um, improving uh, health. So we're going to um, talk about a bit about um, why um, reducing car travel is important. Um, so in terms of transport emissions, um, transport is the largest contributor to UK domestic greenhouse gas emissions um, at um, over 25%. Um, and that figure uh, does not include aviation or shipping. So that's just literally um, sort of private car use. Um, we're looking at a target of net zero emissions by 2050 and increasing walking and cycling is of course a key part of this. Um, in terms of air pollution, we all know that air pollution is a, is a huge worry for, for both us as adults, but also particularly uh, for younger and vulnerable people. Um, so there's an equivalent, estimated equivalent of 3,600 to 4,000 uh, deaths in 2019 were attributed, attributable to air pollution across London. Um, so this is a, a key thing that we're, we're trying to address and again see walking and cycling as a key part of this. So I think we'll now move on to our first activity, um, which we've got something called a Miro board, which, which is sort of a new concept to me. We've just been using them uh, for, for events around the festival. Um, which is quite a, sort of an interactive sort of board where a bunch of us can sort of log in and add notes and pictures and things like that. So um, for this first activity, um, feel free to um, raise your hand to say something or put anything in the chat. But what we're going to be talking about is, um, uh, oh, just for, for, for helping with my street cred, I have a four year old. Um, I do own a car and uh, probably use the car more than we should. But um, these are all sorts of things that, you know, we want to talk about what happens when we are trying to travel with kids without a car and um, how we can overcome some of the key challenges that seem to, to arise um, as part of this. Um, so, I mean, to start off, it was raining this morning. So I was walking to uh, school with a four year old this morning on a rainy day. Um, Luckily, we um, you know, his hair was already wet because I washed his hair this morning, so he looked tidy because it's school photo day. So he wasn't worried about getting his hair wet. Um, everybody else seemed to just, you know, be be getting on with it pretty well. Um, but we do actually have in our in our um, entryway a, a colour changing umbrella for him that he really really likes to use, and then he likes to show people how the planets on it have changed colours when it gets wet. Um, so he, he does actually sometimes get quite excited um, when it when it rains just because he gets to use his fancy umbrella. So some of the other things that we, we've come up um, noted can be sort of a challenge um, to traveling without a car. When you're out and about in London, you know, kids getting bored, kids getting tired and throwing tantrums. Um, we, we've sort of pulled up potentially at a bus stop and they're a bit sick of waiting, but obviously this can happen sort of anytime, anywhere, um, sort of how you can try and get about, you know, a lot of train stations do have, have lifts, but there are some across the borough that do not. Um, and this is particularly inconvenient if um, one of these is your local station. And um, so how do you sort of manage with a buggy at a train station or kids that don't want to go up and down the stairs? Um, and then, you know, how do you deal with along the, the same lines, having just too much stuff to carry and, you know, you, your dog, um, <laughs> picnic for five and a dog heading for a day in, in a park is, is how we sort of put it. So um, if you have any sort of 
personal suggestions on on how to go about any of these again just pop them in the chat i think um got one um so the um i think one of the ones that has come up for for toddler tantrums at a bus stop there's lots of good tips i've heard for this um sort of getting kids to try and read the numbers on the buses um plain i spy and it also works for when you're bored on a train journey although with um southwest rail saying i spy something red doesn't really like help very much because that's half the train <laughs> I think on the um the face with stairs and a heavy buggy at a stage train station um I, I often go past people like strangers that, that offer to carry other people's buggies so it, it, it seems that that's not um although it is a worry um there's a lot of people out there to help who probably will help without you having to ask them or wouldn't mind if you did ask them just to to lift the pram while you while you go down yeah i'd i'd echo that in 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 my my time traveling with with young children and buggies and so on we would we would often get offers of help and one of one of my favorite moments on a on a longer train journey where i was i was on my own with with a baby and um the guard when he was coming along checking tickets asked if i wanted anything fetching from the cafe and there's just just a lot of goodwill out there i think it's been a long time since i've been on a, a train with a cafe on it Sounds well the cafe's maybe overstating it <laughs> um i i think you know for in terms of needing to change the baby when they're out and about when they're really little and in their sort of um lay flat sort of um prime it's quite easy to just change them when they're in there and then when they get a bit older you just have to get a bit more creative about using a wall and yourself as sort of a, a privacy shield to try and um, keep uh, strangers from getting a, a eye full of something that they don't really want to see. I like the photo there of the the rainy day. I, I, it's it's almost like you you sort of also have a challenge of almost trying to sort of rein small children in when it's it's rainy on the way to school because you don't want them to get their clothes all wet before school. <laughs> well, at least in a rain suit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a comment from Lucinda in the chat um, saying how about introducing school trains, walking and cycling groups for school journeys, um, perhaps something PTAs could start up. There was a huge engagement by parents in the school streets programme. I mean, that, that is quite good because I think one of the things that I really gets my son to keep walking and not complain about walking is seeing one of his friends on the way to school. Um, so you, I think there's lots of sort of inadvertent, you know, you leave the house at the same time as someone the next street over, you always sort of run into them. But um, it'd be good to get you know, something a bit more formal so people can take part because a lot of people do take the same same routes. Yeah, we've we've had a few um, walking buses in in the borough, um, and it's just that balance of um, sort of the amount of administration that goes with having something more formal versus the the sort of the more um, the more spontaneous things that occur just by people walking similar routes at the same time of day every day. Um, 
I just saw Lucinda's comment in the chat as well. We don't melt in the rain. Yeah, I've, I've, I know a similar uh, expression to that as we're not made of sugar. You know, we're not, we're not going to dissolve. <laughs> Raphael also says cargo bike for big shopping or picnics. So I think we've got quite good sort of um, range of ideas here that are quite quite good, and I I, I always find these sorts of things very helpful. Um, as otherwise, my my son is not above looking in my handbag to see if he can find snacks. Because um, he doesn't believe me when I say I don't have any. It's like, let me see. <laughs> I I used to um, try and call and still do actually try and um, time longer train journeys with meal times so that the train journey was the the time when you have your your picnic lunch on the way. It is good because it does. It is a good way to pass the time and get them to sit down. And I mean, there's always sort of a puddle of mess around when you're done. But um, you just bring a couple extra napkins and try and do at least a little tidy to to make it look like you're not. Um... And Lucinda commented about mums for lungs. Yes. Um, so my our colleague uh, Lindy Lowe um, leads on the school travel plans program, which is all about um, active travel on the school run, safe, sustainable active travel to school. Um. Um, so I think just in the, we, we've got a good board here. I'm keen to move on to our second sort of um, activity slash section of the Miro board. So I'm going to hand it over to Jane to give us a masterclass in cycling with small children. <laughs> so um, I've moved the Miro board and zoomed in. Is that what's showing up on the shared screen? Um, Jane, yes. I'm sharing the screen currently. Um, do, would you prefer to share the screen from your end so you can add things? I don't, I don't think I need to because when I add on the mirror board, that will show up from your... That's right, yes. It. Yeah, we are all learning on this. Um, so I will flick back to the mirror board, but do let me know if there's stuff in the chat um, that I should be aware of because I can't see that at the moment. So the... Um, the aim for this session really is to talk about cycling with children for, through the different ages, um, both in terms of sharing sharing tips and also giving a bit of an overview of some of the equipment that can be really useful. Um, and so re really we want to hear what anyone, anyone on the call has to say. Um, so do do chip in at any time um, and otherwise I'll just say a bit about what what my experience has been so my my children are now are now teenagers so and and I cycled with them from the age when they were able to sit in a child seat so that tends to be from about about nine months old when they can sit quite stably and hold their heads up okay and so there's a range of equipment out there and i've got some pictures to drag into the to the miro board so probably what everyone's most familiar with is um seats for a child on the bike and on this picture we've got a bike with seats on the front and on the back and um, and there's there's pros and cons for both so the seat on the front tends to be for smaller children um, it's really nice for being able to chat to the child quite easily to see what they're up to um, it's perhaps not as supportive when if the child falls asleep 
so um they can be a bit bit more more floppy but it does have straps to hold them in safely um the seat on the back um is uh i just saw the comment kids love the front seat yeah mine did um the seat on the back is is perhaps a more comfortable ride and, and more supportive and sort of holds them up if they do fall asleep but it can be more tricky if you're carrying luggage as well um so a backpack might get in their face a bit more and it can be a bit more tricky to fit panniers on the bike um then so we're thinking about other options when they're around this kind of nine months and older age and cargo bikes are obviously an option and this isn't something that that um we ever had um but I, I I look at them with with envy, and I know there's there's at least one person on the call who who does have a cargo bike who'd be able to say a bit more about that. Um, and I realise I haven't got my child cargo bike photo handy here, but there is on the slide pack that we're going to be sending round um, after the call. There's there's a range of pictures there for anyone who wants to find out more. Um, and I've just got one more photo for when things don't go quite to plan. It's children falling asleep. It's something that probably comes up quite a bit. Um, we did find that it was quite easy to take the, the back seat off and and prop the prop the bike seat up in the pub garden when needed. Um, moving on to um, the sort of the slightly older phase when they don't quite fit in those those bike seats anymore and they are keen to learn to ride but maybe not to travel so much under their own steam um, and there's a range of um, gadgets for for towing towing the children behind the bike and so I've got a couple of images to add of tagalongs of different types and in fact I have got here a, a type of cargo bike that works really well it's not the typical kind of cargo bike but works pretty well um, for carrying bigger kids and I got that onto the mirror board as well So the um, the different types of um, tag along that I've I've got on the picture, um, there are the the ones where it's the child's own bike that attaches to to the mm. adult bike and can then be unhooked when the child's ready to do some cycling on their own on a traffic free bit or an easy part of the journey. And then there are also um, ones which are in fact just a one wheel version that attaches to the adult bike, um, which is quite, quite a neat way of the child being able to join in the pedalling. But then, of course, you, there's, they can't ride that independently. Um, and then when the children get a bit older and start riding, um, their own bikes independently um, then it's really just a question of building up what what they're able to do um, with sort of plenty of practice in areas away from uh, traffic and one of the things that we found really fun was to take take bikes on trains to get out of London and explore a bit further afield um, and it's worth worth mentioning that you know the bikes can can be carried on on most trains, but you do usually need to, depending on the uh, train company, you often need to book them in advance. So I'm not sure if I've got those pictures into the mirror board. I haven't quite got everything in, have I? Need to make the pictures a bit smaller. Um. 
and then from then we found it was a really gradual process from cycling with the the children's bikes attached to the adult bikes um to having them cycle their own bikes away from traffic and then gradually um cycling on the road um with the child cycling in between two adults or the child cycling in front of an adult so that you can really see uh, how they're getting on and you know give them give them comments as you're going along um, and then the um, school offered um, cycle training and um, so having completed the cycle training courses that also um, made them much more competent cyclists um, and then ready to cycle to secondary school on their own. So that's been that's been our journey of of cycling with children really. Um, happy happy to take any questions or hear anything else anyone else has um, found along the way. I think these are. Uh, is it alright to speak? I'm trying to put stuff in the messaging before if it's alright to, to just say it out loud. That there is an echo. <laughs> um, so just on to me, I think these are all really great ones. I think some of the things that, you know, and I declare an interest in not having um, children myself, but having nieces and nephews who've scooted a lot. Um, but some of the people I know who have kind of, with that image that's kind of top right with the bike extension at the back that's pinned on, I think that that's a really great one for getting little ones cycling. I have seen some parents comment about the difficulty of having adequate space to lock them up in when people are out and about because the normal kind of bike hoops and racks don't really it's really difficult to lock them up so as much as people like being out and about with them I think it's difficult then securing them and I think that's probably a quite similar point with the cargo bikes which, which are great and obviously you can get a couple of little ones in there and shopping as well I've seen some some you know some really great sites of few kids and a whole week's worth of shopping in one of those um, again I think it's just security and people, people are scared about if they can't secure the things properly I think that will deter them but I also think probably something that we haven't discussed is kind of dedicated bike lanes as well I think they they really help when having that space if people feel that they are um, you know parents feel as if, it, if it's just them in the lane then then I think that that really helps kind of feel protected against traffic as well so yeah I think they're all really great things that you've brought up and I, th I think it's also then just like the infrastructure and the safety points alongside that yeah I agree it makes it makes a huge difference when um, either you've got a segregated cycle lane or it's a street where you know there's there's less traffic and um, even even the lower speeds makes a difference because you know that you've got people tend to give you a bit more space and um, it just feels less intimidating. Um, Jane, I think something that um, I mean on the, our timeline it starts at minus six months, but I suppose um, y you as a, a, a parent were cycling a lot before you even had children, so that. The, um, that confidence in just your own cycling by yourself gave you the confidence to have a sort of precious cargo um, with you. Um, so I suppose that's a bad point. <clears throat> yeah, and I also found it was it was fine cycling when pregnant, and obviously that depends on on each individual and what their midwife um, advises. But I I was able to cycle all the way through my pregnancy. And partly because, um, well, it, it helped that I had a very upright bike, a bit like the one in the picture on the top left on the Miro board. Um, so it makes makes more more room for the bump as well as you when you're cycling. Um, so yeah, cycling cycling throughout pregnancy was 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 fine for me, um, but I didn't cycle uh, much when the the children were really little I found that walking when they were sort of babies asleep in a, a pram um, walking was really the way to go.
Hi, Jane. Um, so I'm just picking up that point on the board about the um, like the cargo bike options. Um, and this is partly because I have a sister, so and she has a little one year old. Um, and we're thinking about buying as a family a kind of cargo option for her um, and, and my nephew. Um, and there's loads of options out there. You can go to Halfords and buy like the cheapest one. Um, but I know that there's like some safety considerations. So are there any like resources that are out there for people to see which are the, you know, things that are worth actually spending your money on and which are the safest ones to go for um, if you're not quite, you know, if you'd actually prefer to have a cargo option rather than like a seat on the back or a seat on the on the handlebars? Sure. So one of the um, websites I found while, while we were preparing for this session it's called Cycle Sprogs, and um, the the link is going to be on the the pack that we send round. Um, and it's it's got a huge amount of information. It's really I, I, th I wish I wish it had been around um, when I was looking at these things. Um, so it's it's got sort of reviews of different products and so on. Um, I think there's also a lot to be said to to talking to um, your local bike shops, and I suspect that I, I know Raphael's on the call, and um, and I think I can see he's typing, so he may well have some really um, some really useful tips of where to where to look for um, cargo bikes. Um, for people who live or work in the borough, there's also uh, a scheme try before you bike which the council has um yeah that's what uh, Raphael's referred to a try before you bike is run by pedal my wheels um and which um enables people to uh, pay a monthly fee to use a bike and if they like it then they can carry on paying the installments or or pay it off up front um and if it doesn't work for them they can return the bike without any any penalty so um that can be a a really good option especially for some of these more expensive bikes like cargo bikes and electric bikes um yes yeah, so i i'd i'd recommend that awesome thanks that's really helpful continue on that uh, that point we had a cargo bike for business event on monday and although it was pitched cargo bikes for businesses i think some of the tips are that transferable to families um one thing um that was brought up on it is how um, the company that you buy the cargo bike from it's not just as you buy it and that's it consider the company as the company that can advise you when things go wrong or if you need to have maintenance if you need to have spare parts so when you're buying the cargo bike i think it might be it's quite good to consider how local are they to you is it quite easy to get to um if it breaks down or uh, you need to spare parts um will they be able to sort of help you with advice um so yeah, um, have a have a think about sort of the the proximity of where you're getting the cargo bike from uh, to where you live. I think that's a, another factor. Uh, I see the comment in the chat: storage at home is a real barrier to cargo bikes. And I, yeah, I th I think it is tricky. You do need a bigger a bigger space to park them. And Becky's zooming in on the photo that there are some um cargo bikes that um rather than have the sort of the box that the children sit in they are sort of more sturdy bikes with a longer frame which allows for a a, a bigger seat at the back and which is um robust enough that it's intended for the, the heavier bigger children so those those are worth looking out for as well. I, I'm I'm aware of a couple of um, different companies that make those, and also some with a electric motor to help when you're carrying those heavier kids. Um, Jane, on how did you um, to get the confidence from moving from having a child that sort of 
um, like the example that we've got where they said the bike, their bike's attached to your bike. How did you move from that to having the confidence to um, even cycling on pavements that they're going to stop when they get to a junction, they're not going to whiz out or and even the next step of cycling on the street with you? How do you sort of navigate that sort of fear of a parent sort of? Uh, yeah. So I think it's really gradual with a few leaps along the way. So they start walking and you know that to start with they're really close to you and then gradually they're sort of maybe running off ahead a bit and and sort of right from those early days you're starting to build in you've got to stop at the curb so I think by the time they were um on bikes they were used to following those kind of instructions in the roads or if they're on a scooter they knew sort of not to go too fast on the pavements and things like that so I think children gradually build up over time their sort of uh, their, their general road awareness. Um, and I think that when we first rode on the roads, we did cycle very much with one adult in front and one adult behind. So you felt like if there was, um, if traffic was passing, we were able to sort of position ourselves so that they had to drive quite a bit wider around around the child so that gave them a bit of sort of wobble room um but they also we were also really careful to build up their um their general confidence away from traffic so they'd done quite a lot of pedaling in in traffic free areas so that they were quite confident with the the steering and so on so they were yeah, it's, it was it was it's quite a gradual process. And then the first time we went on the roads, I I think I was with um, a friend with older children, so that also helped um, to, uh, with with our confidence that it is it's it's possible. Um, yeah, so that's it really. Yeah. Thanks, Jane. And and I think the the factor in um, letting them cycle on their own, I think doing cycle training was a was a massive a massive point there. Um, they did cycle training at at the school, but the school also um, had a cycle club, so that built on um, the um, the cycle training. Right, shall we move on to the next sort of um, activity slash section on the mural board? If we scoot over, I can just top. see there's a comment in the chat, um, Margot, that might be worth a, a mention of bike hangers. Um, the, the question is, um, uh, I might not have seen all the comments. More bike shelters on the street. There's a long waiting list. Yes, we are. We are trying to. Um, I, I'm, we, we've got a bike hanger program where we're we're looking to install about a hundred more um, in the short term, and looking at securing funding for um, installing more and more as as we go forward. And awareness of them increases. We seem to get more and more requests. Someone sees one on a, a nearby street and goes, "Oh, I'd like one of those." Um, so we do have a sort of a, a backlog of requests um, from all across the borough that we're trying to um, uh, work our way through as as we get um, funding through. Um, and um, at the moment, the bike hangers only sort of can accommodate standard bikes. They don't. We don't have really an option that works for cargo bikes. Um, I think there's been a lot of sort of research into what sort of products are out there and what's available and what sort of things we can we can do to try and improve upon it um, um so the cost for using the bike hanger so the the bike hangers <clears throat> the spaces in the bike hangers are 72 pounds a year 
And some of the comments that we get about the bike hangers is that people think it's sort of a, a money making exercise for the borough, but um, the fees for the um, bike hangers are um, sort of, they go to the company that manages them, which is called Cycle Hope. Um, they manufacture them and then they manage them. And so all of the, the annual fee is to um, cover the cost of managing it. So making sure that the waiting lists are orderly and making sure that the right people have keys, that they'll replace the key if you lose the key. And the most important thing is the maintenance aspect. So they make sure that um, they are in good repair. Sometimes people try and they sort of fortunately are, are very hard to break into, but people still do try. So sometimes we have to replace bits um, where someone's tried to get a, an angle grinder in and sort of made a cut. So so it covers the um, management and maintenance of the bike hanger. Um, the council doesn't make any money from it. Um, we, we spend a lot of money on it, but we don't make any money on it. Um, I, I think ideally, particularly among, amongst those of us in our team, we would be very keen on increasing the, the on-street car parking permit uh, prices or supplementing um, the membership fees, which is what they do in some boroughs. So I think I think Hounslow, they supplement the cost of biking or membership. Um, but for now, because we know there's so much demand out there for them, uh, the decision has been made to concentrate the funding on buying more bike hangers as opposed to supplementing the um, cost of membership. So hopefully we'll get to a point in the future where um, we are able to sort of um, provide uh, some, some funding towards the cost of membership for residents. But for now, like I said, we're, we're concentrating on just getting more bike hangers on the streets. OK, so just moving on to the um, third um, activity or discussion point. Um, ah, do you know, I'm just um, and we just wanted to think a bit about what is all the stuff that we carry and how how can it be transported car free? Um, so I don't know if people want to add in the chat some of the things that they find difficult to carry and that would prompt them to um, jump in the car for a journey because of that. Um, and we can add that to the to the mirror board here. Dogs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it does always seem a bit ironic that um, Sometimes you need to drive to the park to take the dog for a walk, or drive to the out to the um, out to the country to to have more of a um, exciting walk with the dog. But I think Becky, if you've got a solution for that one. <laughs> yeah, well, um, so I've got a, a lockdown dog, um, and unashamed of that. Um, and but when we were choosing a dog, yeah, it was really important that we we could get enjoy the freedoms that we're used to traveling around the borough, and we weren't constrained by it. So we got a dog that's quite small, that's about ten kilograms, and we, um, yeah, we from a puppy we got it used to being in a rucksack. So um, yesterday, no, on Sunday, I went to Battersea Park with him in my rucksack. Um, he likes it. He puts his head out so he can smell the smell the wind. Um, yeah, so that's that's our workaround. He gets an awful lot of um, points and and comments as we travel around the borough. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think um, when you choose a dog, bearing in mind how you're going to travel with it, is it going to make you jump in a car to go to uh, go on walks with it every day? If so, it's not a, a great use of road space really having cars with dogs. With just dogs in them. Yes, I, I was quite adamant that I wanted to get a dog that I was able to carry, which came in handy when he got stung by a bee in his back leg the other day and refused to walk home and I had to, to carry him, but he's, he's about 11 kilos. So it wasn't too bad, but um, yeah, I think that, you know, alongside that, there's the really sort of big bags of dog food, big bags of cat food, the, the bags of cat litter which I have just given up and, and decided that it's easier to just sort of order them in bulk and try and get as many sort of um, stored around the house as I can to um, minimize the number of deliveries I have for those sorts of things. 
Um, I think what a lot of people do is when you don't have a car, um, my general approach to food shopping is to get the basket. Do not get the cart. You'll go wrong if you get the cart. And when the basket is too heavy, <laughs> it's time to go. Because <laughs> you know exactly how heavy it's going to be to carry home. And you go, OK, that's enough for today. <laughs> and that's how you end yeah. up going to the, to the shop five days a week. But it, um, it, it's sort of a, the, the, the best approach I have found. Yeah, some some things aren't necessarily heavy, but are, are still awkward to carry if they're if they're really bulky. Um, and there's a tip on using ah, uh, so using using bread bags instead of glass bottles for the refill shop. So presumably that's that's not for liquids. That's for um, the grains and so on. Um, yeah, we also get our milk delivered now by like the milkman, um, which is has been obviously they, they they go around in the middle of the night and sort of this milk outside, but it's quite nice for us. I think that it's in glass bottles, so they get reused instead of sort of. Um, bins filling up with the recycling, but they do all sorts of deliveries as well. Um, they do bread and juice and eggs and all sorts of things like that. Yeah, so I think there's um, There's the, sort of the the regular bulky stuff and then there's the occasional bulky stuff as well, like the occasional trip to the tip or the occasional trip to the charity shop after the after the clear out. Um, and I think generally um, there's a lot that can be done either with a, 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 a trolley or trailer, like either a, a traditional shopping trolley. Um, that can also be lifted onto the bus as well if, if you're traveling by public transport. Um, and we've also got um, pictures of the different ways in which bikes can be adapted for, for carrying more luggage, whether that's using a range of panniers or a trailer or um, a cargo bike. And Obviously, a cargo bike for carrying children can double up for carrying um, shopping and things as well. But there's also um, really heavy duty cargo bikes that we, uh, like Becky mentioned, we were talking to different businesses using cargo bikes, whether it's for garden maintenance companies or um, flower deliveries and so on. So I'll just pull in some of these. I'll pull in some of those images onto the Miro board if I can. And something I got, I don't have space, um, like we mentioned on here, I live in a flat which has got a shared hallway, so we've got to be quite respectful about the amount of cycling luggage we put in the shared hallway. So we've got a, um, a trailer that folds up, so on the occasion we need to do heavier stuff, we can use the trailer and we've got a, a WhatsApp for the street so I put on there if anyone wants to borrow the trailer they can so it's it's quite handy if you have got street WhatsApps that were set up through COVID um, to make the most of them to see if anyone's got cycling equipment for that sort of ad hoc use. I like that idea. Um, and I've also seen in the chat Lucinda says a friend put her on her car insurance and um, I, also, I also did that recently and discovered that me being on my friend's car insurance actually put her premium down by £12 a year. <laughs> yeah we, we've got my father-in-law in our car and it, it brings it down as well which um, reminds me of the other option is um, car clubs can be quite handy for these sorts of things. There, there are um, plenty of car club um, 
sort of um, car club vehicles um, throughout the borough that can be sort of um, used for an hour here or there um, can be very handy. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it's really important to remember that even if there are some journeys that you need to do by car, you don't necessarily need to have your own car to be able to do that. Um, and that's really helpful for us as transport planners, given the the, the pressure that we uh, um, the pressure that there is on parking spaces on on the streets. So even if there are uh, journeys that we do by car, if there are less cars parked on the street, that's uh, that's really helpful all around. And and the other thing that I mean, I think people have probably a lot of people have found out one way or another. Black cabs can be great for hauling bulky items because they're because they've got that big sort of open space in front of the seats. Um, I gave a, a a friend a TV um, a while ago, and um, we we used a black cab to, <laughs> just because it w was too sort of bulky to try and move in a, another way. Um, so it's they can also be useful. Um, in a pinch. They're, they're also great emergency breakdown vehicles um, when you're out on a bike. Um, <laughs> it's only been a couple of times that I've had to resort to them, but one time when I was on my bike dashing to get to nursery pickup and I got a puncture, I was able to flag down a black cab and still get there on time with my bike in the cab. That's very, and I, I, I've had issues with those sorts of things and had to wait till after certain times to be able to take my um, bike on the trains because there's sort of a restriction on, you know, taking the full size bikes in the evening. So you have to just sort of wait until later. Um, I think on your point on moving TVs, I think I put in the chat about pedal me up, which I discovered when a friend told me about it. So during lockdown, I uh, had a chair recovered locally and they were going to charge me, I think it was something like £100 to move the chair like half a mile up the road. Um, and I don't have a car, but I, so I used Pedal Me Up for the first time, which was about as cheap as a uh, cab would have been. And they transported the whole chair really well there to do still. And they said that they, they were able to do like house moves and I know locally charities like Little Village use them to move um, their deliveries around. So I think they're a great resource as well. And actually, I'm um, still able to use things like the bike lanes. And, and so, yeah, they probably they might be able to, and they transport people around sometimes as well, I've heard. Yeah, no, that, that is a good, good resource and obviously means um, you're, you're still um, car free. I've also seen some vans um, around for something that's sort of like Uber, but for stuff called Shift, I think it's called, where they have vans where they'll, they'll move stuff around for you as well. I, I haven't used it, but um, um, I've spotted it a few times now. Um, so we are getting low on time. So let, should we go to our sort of last little session, which has probably the most to do with the fact um, that we are at the end of the day, transport planners at the council um, and so um, there are we've we've mentioned bike hangers um, we've um, sort of talked about cycle lanes we are um, working to develop more cycle lanes um, segregated cycle lanes along key corridors in the borough those types of projects are very um, intensive so they do tend to take a long time but um, we're sort of progressing on those as best we can and um, there's quite good political support for those sorts of schemes as well. Um, we're working on doing more on-street cycle parking. We've got a few school streets running around um, the borough at the moment. I think there's 19 for 20 school sites I believe is the number Jane gave me yesterday. Um, we are looking to introduce more school streets and are working with schools um, that have expressed an interest to see if um, sort of that sort of thing can be introduced. Um, for those that don't know, a school street is a timed closure of a street or a part of a street around drop off and pick up times um, to improve safety, air quality around schools and hopefully encourage a few more kids to walk and cycle and discourage car use. Um, 
Uh, we are um, hopefully launching today or tomorrow our um, consultation on our new walking and cycling strategy that will um, lay out more of these things and what we're trying to do. Um, the new walking and cycling strategy is a replacement for the existing cycling strategy, so we are looking to do more um, in particular to support um, walking and that uh, includes things like new pedestrian crossings, improving existing pedestrian crossings, providing some new seating um, along key walking routes um, and public realm improvements. And as we, we learned from our big walking and cycling survey, with the summer things like um, introducing more street trees and things like that also proved very popular. <coughs> Another thing we're doing in Wandsworth, I don't think it's been mentioned yet, is a shared cargo bike scheme. So, I mean, we've talked a lot on the last activity about shared um, shared activities, and to some extent, it works. It works very well at a very local to sort of street level amongst residents to residents. But um, we're um, having a look at trialing a sort of more formal um, shared cargo bike scheme, which where a bike would be um, in a locker um, for residents to, to book out. Um, it would be a, a membership thing, so you would you'd sign up and you'd get training. Um, and so it's not for ad hoc use, it would be for sort of more so regu re more regular use, perhaps five hours a month sort of level of use. So, so do look out for communications on that in the new year. Yes, and there's the comments about school streets. It's it, the school streets has been we we only sort of really started introducing them last year as part of our um, pandemic response, and it's been a bit of a learning curve, I think, in finding the best way to sort of um, uh, to do them both physically in terms of um, you know where they should be, what types of roads they work on, and um, and um, how to enforce them. We initially had to start with sort of volunteers, so we had um, sort of parents and um, primarily and, and local residents who are out there every morning and afternoon telling people not to come down this way. Um, we're moving now to more camera enforcement um, to, to make it a little bit easier for most of them to operate, but um, they, they're, um, they work really well at some locations and obviously a lot of schools are on sort of main roads and things like that where it's not really um, that easy to do. Um, Can I, I'll, I'll just jump mm -hmm. in there that um, there's there, there's some camera enforcement of, of school streets in the borough, um, but it's it's not it's not the silver bullet. So where it's 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 even going forward, it's it's likely to be a mix depending on on what suits um, the particular environment as to whether it's a uh, a camera or whether it's the signs or whether it's uh, volunteers. So um, I think it's it's important just to 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 make clear that cam cameras aren't the the only answer and they're not necessarily the the best answer for a school street. Um, so it's it, as Margot said, it's been very much a learning process. I mean, I'd be interested to hear on the on the call here today because um, I do a lot on the sort of the cargo bike stream of, of the transport work. Um, what help do you think would be useful to get from the council regarding um, more uh, families in, using cargo bikes, so sort of either trikes or bicycles with a sort of big carrying capacity? Have you, has anyone got any ideas on, on what the council could do to encourage more of those? If so, um, Adam is in the chat will speak up. I think that giving people uh, an opportunity to try them is 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 quite powerful. Um, I think you've you've been involved in events, haven't you, Becky? Where um, 
there's been a number of, of, of cargo bikes for people to just sort of see what the different models are and um, have, a, have a test ride. And I think often it's by by word of mouth that once once one family in a neighbourhood has a cargo bike and and people get to hear more about it, then it sort of grad gradually spreads. Um, but I think the idea of of helping that along the way is um, it's a good one.